well, the, the most fundamental role of NAD is the one I was describing, sort of accepting and donating electrons. And there's about 500 reactions in the cell that require it for that purpose. And that regenerates it. It goes to NADH and then it goes back to NAD and you don't really destroy it. The sirtuins are one of the uh, classes of enzymes that actually use the NAD molecule as a co-substrate and break it down and kick off the nicotinamide. So I would love to work together with you and try to explain to our users as best as we can how the science is studying today and what, uh, based on that, maybe each of uh, the listeners can uh, take his own or her own direction of whether they should use it and what they should use and so on. So I would like to start with a, a NAD, an explanation about what is NAD and why it's so important for metabolism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so NAD is a metabolic cofactor, and it's it's involved in the sort of the nuts and bolts of of metabolism, right? When we take in carbohydrates or fats, and you know, trying to turn those into usable energy, they go through a series of biochemical transformations, and many of those steps depend on on having NAD there to accept high energy electrons and then donate them back in other reactions, or to donate them directly to the electron transport chain in the mitochondria, which is what gives that that uh, organelle the energy it needs to generate usable ATP. And so without NAD present, you actually can't have any sustainable path to generating ATP and, and cells can't survive any cell at all. And we know humans can't survive even with a severe nutritional deficiency when you still have a substantial amount of NAD in your body, you, you get a fatal disease called pellagra, uh, which ends up uh, cause, causing neurological symptoms and skin symptoms and, and uh, eventually ends up being fatal. And uh, how NAD is converted to NADP plus, and uh, also uh, maybe as a follow-up question, uh, if you can explain what's it, what is ATP and why is it important? Sure. Well, so so ATP is adenosine triphosphate, right? and this is sort of the the energy currency of cells. Uh, most of the things that are taking place in our body uh, that require energy do it by cleaving ATP as a as a coupled reaction. And so so whatever energetically the yeah, unfavorable process you want to happen um, is done in a way that catalytically uses a molecule of ATP and uses the energy from breaking that molecule to fuel the the event you're trying to trigger. So it's it just can be thought of as really as the, as the energy currency of the cell. Um, NAD, as I was saying, is required for every sustainable path to generate ATP. And if you can't generate ATP, um, that, that's the end of the line for the cell, right? You need it to, to keep the cell alive. Um, so you touched on NADP, which is a related molecule that's a phosphorylated form of NAD. Um, and really, the, so the only source of NADP is from NAD. It does get phosphorylated by a kinase. And essentially, those uh, that duplication of that function by making a different form of NAD essentially allows those two molecules to have different sets of cofactors that they regulate, but they have the same function. They both accept electrons and, and donate them back in different types of reactions. Um, but what's so the NAD is actually uh, NAD plus is the way it's usually written because there's a positive charge delocalized on the nicotinamide ring, and when it accepts those high energy electrons, it gets reduced to NADH, and so there is this property of the cell or the state of a given compartment within the cell is the ratio of NAD to NADH, and that helps push different reactions backward or forward, and the fact that you have NADP as an alternative. Uh, you know, a cofactor that can do those types of reactions allows you to have two different redox states, one for NAD and one for NADP. So in the cytosol, NAD is mostly oxidized as NAD+, and NADP is mostly reduced as NADPH. And so you can have them pushing uh, opposite sides of this redox equation, I guess, for different reactions that you want to go different ways. Excellent. Thank you so much for the explanation. And the uh, NAD is uh, maybe become very famous, again, based on the protein that both you and me used to work on, which is uh, the CIR2 family of uh, uh, the acetylase. So can you explain how NAD is connected to the CIR2 family? Yeah, so so CIR2 so um, and, and the related molecules were found to be uh, deacylases. So they remove acyl chains, um, the smallest and most common one being an acetyl group from proteins. And... This was a big discovery by Shin and Mai that unlike other proteins that catalyze that activity that, that can remove acetyl groups, uh, sirtuins specifically require NAD as a cofactor. And the acetyl group ends up attached to the ADP ribose part of, of NAD. Uh, and, and that is generally a theme for a lot of the things that NAD does 
other than the electron uh, accepting and donating for the enzymes that use it for other purposes, um, it's kicking off that nicotinamide moiety and, and the remaining part um, ends up being able to accept you know, other molecules or be attached to things very easily. The nicotinamide is a good leaving group to leave a space for something else to attach there to that backbone. Um, and so uh, for the sirtuins, uh, you know, and this was a big revelation that they had this NAD dependent activity that hadn't been seen before to remove groups. Um, and then the idea of, that logically followed from that was that maybe you could regulate their activity by regulating NAD levels. Uh, and certainly you can, if you knock NAD levels down low enough, the sirtuins are not active. Uh, it's a more complicated question, how far you can push their activity by increasing NAD beyond normal. Um, and that gets into a lot of the uh, the reason why there's so much confusion in this field is that NAD is compartmentalized in different places. Some of it's protein bound, some of it's not. It's got this inherent redox state that's hard to measure. And so just knowing, for instance, the KM of a protein for NAD doesn't give you enough information often to predict whether or not it's going to be sensitive to small changes in NAD levels. It really, uh, you can have to take a very deep dive in there just to understand how much we don't know about, <laughs> about sort of uh, predicting which proteins are going to be responsive. Yeah, and a side note about you mentioned that uh, Shinimai uh, discovered the uh, NAD dependency of sirtonin. And actually, when I joined the lab, Shin already left, but uh, I, uh, I got his uh, a seat in the lab. And uh, I remember the big mass spectrometry that uh, he had there that uh, basically we he used to discover it. And uh, it was a, a, a really exciting time at the Garretta lab uh, following this discovery, which was a real revolution. Speaking on which, CIL2 is not the only uh, protein that is uh, activated by NAD to make it even more complex, the story, than what it was before. So can you elaborate on that? And what other protein are activated or uh, need the cofactor of AD, NAD in order to be active? Right. So just take a step back, too, because I, I kind of jumped into the sideways saying, first of all, the, mo the most fundamental role of NAD is the one I was describing, sort of accepting and donating electrons. And there's about 500 reactions in the cell that require it for that purpose. And that regenerates it. It goes to NADH and then it goes back to NAD and you don't really destroy it. The sirtuins are one of the uh, classes of enzymes that actually use the NAD molecule as a co-substrate and break it down and kick off the nicotinamide. Um, so other enzymes that do that include PARPs, which were actually discovered to do that first, like poly-ADP ribosyl transferases. Um, these enzymes will kick off the nicotinamide and use stick the rest of the NAD molecule onto a protein as a modification. Um, and in the case, of, some of them are just mono ADP ribosyl transferases, but the name comes from the poly ADP ribosyl transferases that will keep then stacking units onto that um, and signal for things like apoptosis or DNA repair. Um, there are classes of enzymes that uh, generate uh, cyclic ADP ribose, so in, they actually don't make the molecule connect to itself where the nicotinamide used to be. Um, and that's important in calcium signaling. And so um, CD38 is one of the ones that can do that. There's been some debate back and forth about which enzymes uh, produce the most cyclic ADP and which were, you know, were, which produce the physiologically meaningful amounts. But that is one of the activities of, of, of CD38, uh, which is important in immune cell signaling. Uh, there's another enzyme that's gotten famous much more recently called SARM1 uh, that turns out uh, to be the enzyme that is responsible for uh, causing axonal degeneration. So there's this really famous uh, mouse where you could sever the axons from neurons and they would just go on to live by themselves free floating for weeks. And the mutation that caused that turned out to be um, in a, a fusion with NMNAT1, which is one of the NAD biosynthesis enzymes that would cause it to mislocalize and generate a lot of a, um, NAD in the axons. Uh, and it turns out that that would counteract the activity of this enzyme SARM1 that depletes all the NAD in the axon and as part of the process of, of it dying. And so when you have this counteracting activity and maintained NAD levels in axons, they, they'd survive for weeks. And so SARM1 okay. was discovered in that context and is now being studied in neurodegeneration, but is actually much more widely expressed and, and people are getting much more interested in how that is relating to overall NAD metabolism.